Welcome back students to our Chemistry 1510 video notes. In this video, we're going to talk about limiting reactants. So before watching this video, you've already watched Tyler DeWitt's video on an introduction to limiting reactants because he goes through a lot of really good life examples. And I'm going to do one really short one here that we're going to continue to point back during our time in this video. So you've seen a sandwich example before. It's a great one. So here in my sandwich example, my way to make a sandwich is very simple. So you need two slices of bread for a sandwich and three slices of ham makes one sandwich. So if you have 18 slices of bread and 21 slices of ham, how many sandwiches can you make? Now most of you can do this in your head without writing anything down. And that's not the point. The point is to figure out what to write down so that when we move into an unfamiliar unit of moles, we have something to grab onto that makes sense. So what we want to write down is our two starting materials. We have 18 slices of bread and we have 21 slices of ham. And during this, we're going to do some sandwich stoichiometry. So from our balanced chemical equation, we're gonna say two slices of bread make one sandwich, and three slices of ham make one sandwich. So from our bread slices, we can make nine sandwiches. But from our ham slices, we can only make seven sandwiches. So how many sandwiches can you actually make? Well, you can make seven. Yeah, you have enough bread to make two more sandwiches, but you ran out of ham. So you cannot make more sandwiches. So this, again, is something that's very tangible so people can logic their way through it. As soon as we change it to moles, when we come back and we say we box the smallest one, students will say why, and then we'll come back to the sandwich example. So notice how we go through the process and we say 18 slices of bread, through our stoichiometry can make nine sandwiches, 21 slices of ham through our stoichiometry can make seven sandwiches, seven smaller than nine, so that's how many sandwiches you can make. So now let's talk about what's left over. So again, in the what's left over oh. realm, what we're looking for, sorry, um, is trying to do the math and the setup to figure out how much is left over because I know you can mentally do this. It's not about mentally doing it. It's about doing the setup so that when we switch to that unit you're unfamiliar with, we have something to look back to. So if we wanna figure out what's left over, there's actually multiple ways to do this. One of the ways to do this is to say, I know I can make seven sandwiches. And with my seven sandwiches, I can figure out how much bread I need. So for every one sandwich, I need two slices of bread. So that means I need 14 slices. So you need 14 slices of bread to make your seven sandwiches, which I've abbreviated as Sammy's, and you have 18 slices of bread available. And so what you do is a subtraction. You have 18 slices of bread, All right? This is what you have. You use 14 slices, making the seven sandwiches that you know you can make. And so you have four slices left over. So looking at this, 
a lot of times students know they have to do a subtraction. And so when they're starting to consider the possibility of a subtraction, what they'll do is they'll say, oh, I've got a number here and I've got a number here, let's subtract them. And so if you take nine and subtract seven, you only get two because they're not taking into account that uh, your, you could make two additional sandwiches if you had uh, enough ham and that each sandwich uses two slices of bread. Right, so that's another way to do it. So you can either start with how many sandwiches you know you can make, figure out how much bread is needed for those sandwiches and subtract from how much bread is available. Or you could do your subtraction up front, up here, and then say that you have, you could make two more sandwiches and for each sandwich you need two slices of bread so you have four additional slices that didn't get used. So like I said, there's more than one way to solve this problem. We just need something tangible to look back to when everything gets confused, uh, confusing when we start talking about moles. So this same reasoning that we're talking about here of things getting used up is true with chemical reactions as well. And that the one of the compounds in the reaction is going to get used up first. And of course, it's not always true, but it's really, really hard to plan out a reaction where all your reactants get used up, right? Something is going to be left over. So the limiting reactant is the reactant that gets used completely during the course of that chemical reaction. And the reason it's called the limiting reactant is because it stops you, right? It limits you from making more of the product. So let's look at a typical limiting reactant problem. So here is one where we have a balance, well, a not yet balanced chemical equation. And it's saying that you have 225 grams of silicon tetrachloride and 225 grams of magnesium. And it's asking you to calculate the mass of silicon that can be made. So what we know is that we have 225 grams of this, we have 225 grams of this, and we're searching for the mass of silicon that can be made. So the first thing that you want to do is balance your chemical reaction. So we're going to balance this really quickly. And after you have a balanced chemical reaction, the second thing you probably want to do is recognize that this is a limiting reactant problem. The way that you're going to know it's a limiting reactant problem is that you're going to have reactants for, I'm sorry, masses for two reactants. It could be more, but that would be kind of mean. So what you can do is go through with these two and determine the limiting reactant. There's two ways to determine the limiting reactant. I am going to show you one way to determine the limiting reactant that the majority of students like the most. If you don't care for this way, you're welcome to go into your text and look at the other way. So one way to determine the limiting reactant is to, oh, for heaven's sakes, is to go through the process that you've already learned how to do, where you start with your uh, 225 grams of silicon tetrachloride, and you're going to go from silicon tetrachloride all the way to silicon, right? So you're gonna do the whole grams to moles to moles to grams things. So let's do that with our silicon tetrachloride. So our first step, and I'm going to write our little map out more thoroughly. I'm going to go grams to moles to moles to grams. So we need the molar mass of silicon tetrachloride. So you can take a moment, real quick, calculate that, right? You take your 35.45, or is it 5.4? I need to get a periodic table in my house um, in front of me. And... <laughs> Uh, you're going to multiply that by 4 and add the mass of silicon. So when I did that, I got 169.89 grams of silicon tetrachloride. And that's per one mole. 
So our grams cancel here. Then from our balanced chemical equation, we need our mole to mole ratio. Well, if I look at my balanced chemical equation, I've got one mole of silicon tetrachloride is used to make one mole of silicon. So then, now that I'm in moles of silicon, I now will convert to grams. So one mole of SI has a mass of 28.09 grams. So I'm gonna go through this process not once, but twice, because I'm gonna go through the same process with the magnesium. So I've got my 225 grams of magnesium, and magnesium has a molar mass of 24.31 grams in one mole. So now our grams of magnesium have canceled. We want to go from moles of magnesium to moles of silicon. So our balanced chemical equation says two moles of magnesium are used when you create one mole of silicon. So now, again, our moles of magnesium have canceled. We want to get to grams, so we say one mole of silicon is 28.909 grams of silicon. So our moles cancel. So we're going to go through this whole... Um, so we're going to go through the entire calculation. We're going to get a final answer. And we're going to get these two items. Now from here, a lot of times students get stuck. And they look at this and they think, I don't know what to do from here. Remember, you, are, you have one final answer. And that is the least amount that can be made. So you box the smaller amount. This is the grams of silicon that can be made. So whichever one gives the smaller amount gave you the limiting reactant, which I'm abbreviating LR there. All right, so silicon tetrachloride is your limiting reactant, and from this reaction, you can make 37.0 grams of silicon. So when we start looking at these types of reactions, we never actually get that 37.0 grams of silicon if we were to carry this out. We always get less than that. So what we tend to do is calculate something called percent yield. And in order to prepare us for percent yield, I need to point something out. And that is that this number here that I'm highlighting, this is called your theoretical yield. So this is the amount of silicon that you would technically be able to make if everything worked out perfectly in lab and nothing got lost if the reaction was able to go to completion. So that's your theoretical yield. Your actual yield would be what you actually um, got when you were in lab. So let's look at an example of percent yield. Oh goodness, I'm gonna pause for a moment and go upstairs. Okay, so let's look at that percent yield. So the percent yield is what you got, which is the actual yield, divided by what you calculated, which is the theoretical yield. So if you carried out that reaction that produced silicon um, that we were talking about above, just real quick, correct that error if you need to, what you would get is I you would say, computer. thank you for kissing my computer. I'm making a video now, baby. Uh, your percent yield is your actual over theoretical times 100. So again, your actual <sighs> is your 30.0 grams. Your theoretical was the 37 times 100. So I got uh, 80 something. 81 and it would be 
eight, but because we only have three sig figs, we're gonna do 81.1%. So you can go ahead and try the next problem. Um, pause for a moment, come back, and I'll have it worked out for you. Okay, so here is a problem that puts all of it together. And so like I said, this problem puts it all together. Go ahead and look at this. Um, and we will stop this video at this point. As always, thank you for your attention and your patience with my children. Uh, this is Katoni signing out.